All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this month's NCLS special event. Um, thank you all for being here today. Today, we are joined by Dr. Jessica Rodriguez. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Special Ed at the University of Missouri, and she has been exploring and sharing innovative approaches to widely communicating education research through findings through uh, visual and translational visual abstracts. And we are so excited to hear from her today. So join me in welcoming Jessica. I will hand it over to you now. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is really exciting. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you all today. I get excited meeting other people who get excited about research communication and how to share research, and especially as related to mathematics. So I am just so excited, and I hope I can you know, communicate with each one of you individually. I hope we can you know, either chat today or chat after, because if you're here, it probably means that you have some interest in this area. And so I hope we can just chat more. That is my hope. So thank you so much. I know you're all very busy, but I hope we can um, have some good conversation today. Okay, getting my slides up here. So I was asked to share about communicating research tips for sharing math cognition research with wide audiences. To share just a bit about me first, um, I grew up in New York. I did undergrad, my master's degree there. So East Coast stayed there for my PhD. I did that at the University of Delaware with my amazing advisor. Dr. Nancy Jordan and met Brie there. So that was wonderful. And then from there, I did a two-year postdoc. So um, is it accurate that many people here in attendance right now, is there are there a lot of doc students? Is that primary? I see Brie nodding. Yeah, it seems to be. I'm looking around. Maybe some postdocs as well. But I always like to say whenever I'm speaking to graduate students, if you have questions about postdoc fellowships and what that could look like, I'm always happy to chat about that too. So feel free to reach out. I know there's a lot of questions about like, what does that look like for my life? What could that look like? For me, it looked like moving to California for two years and having a life adventure on the West Coast of the US and that was you know really exciting. So that was at the University of Southern California, USC. And then from there it landed my current position at the University of Missouri at the um, in the Department of Special Education. And I absolutely love it here. So now I'm right in the middle of the US and it's been really great. So I think that is can be one of the challenging things about academia, moving around a lot, but it can also be a really exciting part of it too. So I've enjoyed it. I also am the director and run the Mathematics Potential Lab. I see that some of the Math Potential Lab members are attending right now. Thanks for the support, I see you there. Um, so we are a research team of graduate students and undergraduate students seeking to support students' mathematics understanding, mathematics achievement. So we are having a lot of fun in that lab and I work with a great team. And I also just wanted to mention that I love MCLS. So my first time attending MCLS was back in 2017. It was held at the campus of Vanderbilt University. And I remember being very proud. I was a poster competition awardee. This was when I was a doc student. And I even found the photo from when I was presenting, presenting um, fraction intervention work with my advisor, Nancy Jordan, and wonderful colleagues. And I was so surprised that I was able to find the, the photo. I was very excited. But I also attended the 2022 um, conference in Belgium. And this was one demonstration of kind of what I'll be chatting about today. You know, during the conference, I attended this great panel session called Interventions for Improving Math Skills. And something that I do at conferences, if you see me attending your conference presentation one day, I will likely have my laptop 
with me and I'm working away because I'm creating like a live infographic during the session to kind of summarize some of the key messages and then I share it out on social media. So I kind of view it as a way to um, further disseminate the great work that's being shared in a conference session so that it's not just confined to the people sitting you know, in the audience, that it can reach more people or even reach more people who are at the same conference, but they had to attend a different session or they were presenting at the same time you were presenting, so they didn't get to hear your great session. So I have fun with that. So that was the full infographic. I had to break it up so that you could see it better on the slide. But I created that live in the moment, then tweeted it out, and I had a lot of fun with it. So who I am as a researcher foundational to my research program is the belief that supporting each child's math success partly relies on increased attention to the innovation and investigation of research communication strategies. So I see it as this great complement to my re research program to focus on how we can better communicate the research, the wonderful research that you are all doing, that we're doing, um, so that it can reach who we want it to reach and benefit who we want it to benefit. So for me, I'm often thinking about the child sitting in the classroom and how I can try to get, you know, research findings into the classroom to benefit that child. And by the way, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, I'm very flexible, you know, just put them in the chat or just, you know, speak out. Absolutely, that would be fine. So before I get into... Um, the specifics I want to talk about. Well, first, I do have this quote, too, that's been on my mind lately, and I like sharing it in presentations, is that nothing in science has any value to society if it is not communicated, and communicated well, right? We need to think about how to communicate well and for different audiences, and we need to investigate the effectiveness, too, instead of just making assumptions about what is the best way for me to get my work out there into the world. So that's what I want to talk about today and empower you, equip you with some principles, strategies for designing how you disseminate and communicate your work. But before jumping into that, if you can just humor me for a second, there'll be a connection. But if you can think about, reflect on a time recently when you gave someone a present, a gift. So a family member, a close friend, a birthday present, whatever it might be, celebrating a special occasion. So imagine that gift and then think about the thought process that went into that gift. How did you decide to give them that specific gift? And preferably think about a gift that they they seem to like, <laughs> that, that went over well, that they seem to value. And what was that thought process? in selecting the gift and knowing what to gift them, what should be the present for this individual person. So often you might be thinking about what hobbies they enjoy, um, what they like to do in their spare time or something very practical if they like for those practical types of gifts, something they could use every day or maybe something um, that's a little fancier than what they treat themselves to and you wanna, you wanna treat them in some way or just something that they really, really like, like a favorite dessert, whatever it might be. You're not thinking, you're not giving a gift solely based on what you like, right? You're not just thinking, well, what would I like to get as a gift? Oh, that's what I'll get this person. You're thinking about the person and what they want. So it's not about you in this situation, but it's about the person, it's about them. And I see that as a connection and analogy to thinking about our research communication and wanting to reach our target audience. It's not about us. It's not about what makes sense to us or, you know, us having our assumptions of, oh yeah, th this would, this is what will reach them and this, they'll view this as being valuable. We really need to try to put ourselves in their shoes. Um, especially if we have a lack of, you know, research evidence, ideally we would have empirical research studies showing like this is effective and so on for this audience. But if we don't have that yet, at least be thinking about how to put ourselves in their shoes, like as if we were giving a present to someone, we think about what would be valuable to that person. Here we're thinking about what is valuable to my target audience. 
And that's really essential. I kind of view it as like working backwards from there. We want to think about who we're trying to reach and then work backwards from there and thinking about how we design our dissemination. And I did just want to, you know, briefly kind of go over some of the current practices, but also their limitations for translating research for wide audiences. So one primary practice if we're thinking about communicating with teachers, for example, would be the practitioner journal article. And this is written for a teacher audience. They go through a peer review process in an offer in an effort to present information that is trustworthy based on research evidence. So that's fantastic. And I love these types of articles. I think they are incredibly important. But unfortunately, there is research indicating that researchers, the target audience here, do not frequently engage with these practitioner journals or journal articles. So I think they're valuable, they're important, but we are seeing that there is not so much engagement there. And there have been scholars that have proposed that publishing articles is maybe not enough to communicate with certain wide audiences such as teachers. So rather we might need to translate it and have these types of like specialist resources. So in addition to these articles that we're used to, our empirical journal articles, practitioner articles and whatnot, we might also need these specialist type resources. And one such type resource is known as the research summary, or they go by many different names, plain language summary, accessible summary. And these are using accessible language for broader audiences, for non-academic or non-scientific audiences. And I'm sure you might have seen some of these. You might have worked on one or developed one yourself. But interestingly, Yes, they're called summary and they're meant to be for wider audiences, but a lot of them are still pretty long. They're lengthy. So they're, they can be like three up to 14 pages. Um, that's a recent study that was looking at research summaries. And this could understandably still feel very overwhelming. So even though it's intended for wider audiences and to be accessible, just even in terms of length, I mean, how many times do you open up a PDF and you're hoping like, is this like a short article or is this a long article? I mean, we all are competing for attention and we're all exhausted and we're all time constrained. And especially for thinking about white audiences who are incredibly busy people, like such as teachers, that's just the example that comes to mind for me first, incredibly busy professionals and individuals. So that's overwhelming. And we have to be thinking too that these specialist type resources, it's hard to be concise and get to the point essentially, but if we view the purpose of these resources to be just to kind of grab attention, to have someone be able to look at it relatively quickly and be able to say relatively quickly, oh, you know what, this might be relevant to me. This might be interesting to me. Maybe I'll save it and I'll look into this later. You know, so, or maybe I do want to read the longer resource, the longer article that delves into this more. If you view these resources to kind of just be like, grab their attention, see if they're interested, then it can maybe um, have that freedom or that comfort to, you know, make it more concise. So what can we try instead? That's what I'm getting at here. So there are these more innovative research summary type resources that are informed by this success framework. And this is all in considering those limitations of other types of specialist resources that it might be lengthy or time consuming or full of you know, jargon and academic type language even. So maybe instead we should have more concise and more clear resources that just get to the point, that get to the key research messages that the audience can then quickly and easily peruse to assess if they're interested in learning more about the topic. Or maybe if you're trying to recruit participants or teacher partners or so on for an upcoming study. Something that just lets them quickly assess oh, this does sound interesting to me. I, I might want to participate in this. Let me click or 
take the next action step that they're telling me to take to learn more. So you don't necessarily have to put it all into the resource. You don't need all the details. So this Heath and Heath success framework, it has been suggested as a vehicle for reducing the research practice gap. And it informs the framework, informs the ideas for these concise type of research summaries. And they highlight different key principles or elements for increasing the memorability or the stickiness of a message. So what I'm going to share with you is based on principles from that framework, but I'm going to hone in on three principles in particular for impactful research communication. And these three principles can be helpful for all different types of things. I know that some of you were interested in more like study fact sheets or research summaries. Um, I do work in visual abstracts and infographics too can be powerful. So all of these principles, I think, can be helpful for thinking about just how we communicate in general after research that can be helpful for all of these different types of resources that you might want to be designing or that you are designing for your research for reaching those wide audiences. So the first key principle that I want to share is simplicity. And it sounds simple, but it is not simple. So simplicity. So this entails prioritizing the information selected for communication. So again, if you're trying for these specialist, concise type resources, you're not going to get in all the details that you are used to sharing and you're used to being so thorough. So here we're thinking that in essence, less is more. Again, you're trying to grab the attention of your target audience. So this principle, it supports the usefulness of those concise, maybe one page or even shorter resources that inherently require that you prioritize information. And then also this idea of simplicity can also align with using non-technical language for broad audiences. And simplicity is so not simple. I cannot stress that enough. Um, this will be, it is a whole other skill, I think. It's something I am absolutely still working on. And each time when I sit down to design a visual abstract, for example, I, I still struggle with it each time. Having to prioritize and select what information to include and what to take out. It can be painful to sometimes take out information, but every time as I work on the process and when I get to the final outcome, it's a, it, it makes sense once I get there. Like, okay, yes, this is all that's really needed for the purpose of what I'm using this for. A connection I've been making to it recently, I've been working on um, grant proposals recently. That's been a big part of my job as a you know early career assistant professor. And with um, grants, you often need to write a one pager. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a, usually a one page. One pager, you have to fit it into one page and you're providing an overview of your entire grant. It could be a five-year proposal that you're planning with all these different complex studies and all these things going on. And you need to somehow write the overview of like why your work is important, why that those five years of work are important, the overview of your work, what um, methods you're going to use, why it's important, what the broader impacts are. You have to like fit all of that into one page. And it can feel overwhelming. And in a way, it's like you're taking that maybe 20 page research proposal that's overviewing five years of work and you have to, in a way, simplify it, right? I could not, this one pager here, sample, I could not fit in all of the details of my grant proposal. I can't tell you everything I'm planning to do, every single detail. I need to be, had to be selective to fit it in. And it was really tough. So you would think maybe writing a one pager, oh, okay, that won't take that much time. That'll be easy. But actually I spent a lot of time on my one pagers for my grant proposals. Maybe 
more time than anything else, potentially. I, I worked on it a lot, many revisions, because being simple is not easy. And conveying your messages in a clear, concise, helpful, accessible way, it takes time, or at least it does for me. But again, this is a big part of my life right now, writing grants. I love it. I love grant writing. All right, everyone. I think <laughs> Jessica's internet must have got out, so I'm going to message her and uh, try to get her back on. Hi, Jess. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Sorry, we lost you there. Yeah. Okay. I just need a. Yep. Put you back as a co-host. I was so sad. I was like, oh no. <laughs> I know. And then I tried to You're jump making back. Making a great point. I was using the <laughs> I was like, what, what is happening right now? I came to campus so that I would have strong Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. So I was talking about the um, grant one pager. It takes me a lot of time. You think it'd be simple, not simple, in my opinion, in my experience. And like I said, I've, I've been getting into this whole grant writing thing. It's my new obsession. So I've been reading this wonderful book by Dr. Betty Lai, The Grant Writing Guide. And um, one thing that stood out to me from reading this this quote over to the right there that this one researcher that she interviewed um, shared the time he spent writing his grant sections estimated that he spent 150 hours total writing a particular grant. And of those 150 hours that about 72 of them were spent on his one pager. And to me, again, I didn't speak directly to this researcher, maybe they would attribute it to different factors, but to me, it kind of stands out as another example of how simplicity or being concise can be incredibly challenging. And you kind of, with your grant proposals, with the one pager, you're hoping to capture the attention of your reviewers, get them on board quickly, and with these concise research summaries, it's kind of the same, right? You're trying to grab the attention or interest of your target audience and pretty quickly. You don't want to lose them. So you want it to be well done and it does take time. So I'm not saying you have to spend 72 hours on it. Definitely not. That's a whole different story. But I just thought it was kind of another interesting example um, showing how tough it can be to be concise. And we are used to doing things like this. So we are trained, your doc student, a postdoc, faculty. I mean, we're all, this is how we're trained, right? To be thorough, we're trained to write papers that look like this, where, you know, we're trying to fit in every little detail. And when we critique papers, when we're reviewing papers for our peers, our colleagues, we're like, well, how, how long did that assessment take? Why didn't you mention how many minutes that took? Or you need to include this, or where is the, um, you know, you need to report the reliability coefficient and this and that. That is what we're trained to do. We're trained to make tables that are complex and have every little bit of data and to make models that look like this. So it is not simple to kind of step away from that to create something that's more friendly and not academic based language and something that doesn't include every single detail of your very impressive work. You have to be selective when you're designing something like this. You're thinking not about 
you and your work and all like all the critical details, you're instead thinking which parts of this is valuable to my audience. So even though simplicity is not simple, I will say that what I think is um, that simplicity is a superpower. And I also just love alliteration, simplicity, superpower. So simplicity is a superpower. So I mean, I can speak to my own career that I have been focusing a lot on this and working on how to communicate research with different audiences and this idea of simplicity is central to everything that I do nowadays and I have feel like it I feel like it has amplified my career in so many different ways and people are seeking out the knowledge and they want to learn how to do it and I have so much fun thinking about that and doing things like this a webinar it's so much fun it's a skill that other people want to learn about so if this is something that you are particularly interested in, I would also be happy to chat to you more about that and because it has been such a game changer for me and a game changer also just in terms of how I write, how I communicate, how I put together my presentation. So all these principles that go into how I design an infographic based on research, for example, are the same principles I think about when I'm putting together a presentation or when I'm working on my lesson plan for my the classes I teach here at MU and so on. These principles are effective when I'm even writing a tweet for Twitter. You gotta be concise on Twitter too. So it impacts so many areas of my work and my life and I just find it so exciting and so interesting. So if you're someone that you also find it interesting, we should probably be collaborating. So let's chat. Okay, so the second key principle, so we talked about simplicity, the second one I want to share is concreteness. So again, this is based on that success framework, but also in relation to thinking about our work and how we can share it with wide audiences, how I think about it is clear and vivid takeaway messages or clear and vivid action steps. And something I've been thinking a lot about is this idea of concreteness in terms of, so I mentioned how I do a lot of visual abstracts. So if you aren't familiar with what that means, um, the abstract of a research article, we're all familiar with, right? That like brief overview looks like, you know, short paragraph overview of an entire study. And so a visual abstract has the same goal. You want to overview the entire research study, um, but have it be a little more friendly, more accessible, maybe use um, colors and minimal text, so less words, minimal text, maybe some icons that go along with your main ideas, but it's still overviewing the entire study. But you have to be selective. So maybe you have three research questions, your visual abstract, you want to be more concise, so maybe you just hone in and focus in on one of those research questions and the findings associated with it. But even, so that's one way of being concrete with a visual abstract, but I've been thinking even more so about it and have an upcoming project where I'll be investigating the effectiveness of a visual abstract that does summarize an entire article, but then also what I've been term calling a key abstract that instead of providing an overview of the whole study, it hones in on one key like takeaway message. Or if we're talking about communicating with teachers, for example, or parents, it would instead be one key like practical takeaway message that parents can do with their kids at home, for example. So kind of like a the recommendation section or the practical implication section of an empirical article even. If you have those recommendations embedded in your article, creating a resource, a key abstract, a visual abstract that doesn't summarize all the research that you did to get to that recommendation, but instead just puts forth that recommendation, makes it you know quick and easy to absorb, and then you could link to your full article. So if someone's like, oh, What's the research supporting this? Or, oh, I want to learn more about the article um, behind this, that they still have access to that too. So that is something that I will be exploring very soon. I'm very excited to. So this idea of being concrete. And this is also supported by research that 
suggests that teachers' awareness of research via dissemination of explicit recommendations can positively impact their research use. So that's really important and powerful. And also concrete messages or recommendations like explicit recommendations for practice, it can also support the audience's perceived relevance. Is this relevant to me and to my practice? Could this help me? Um, their perceived relevance, which can be another factor that impacts research use. And that's important to mention too, you know, all of the things that I'm suggesting and that I've been exploring, it's more so focused on like increasing research awareness in a way, and it's not yet getting to that research use part that's future directions of my work. But that's really important to think about, right? But we can't have that use piece if we don't first increase awareness. And I think that's a big gap that we're currently all facing right now is, you know, just our target audience, like lack of awareness of research and not because of any fault of theirs, but because of us. And we need to be more attentive to how we're communicating our research. It's my opinion. And the third principle I wanted to share, which cannot be overlooked, so important, is the idea of accessibility. And I think a lot of the ways, in many ways, the first two principles already touch on this, but other ways we can improve accessibility, I think providing information in multiple formats to reach multiple people, and then a more you know, clear recommendation here would be using like alternative text, for example. So if you're um, sharing something on social media and it's a visual, an infographic, something like that, having alternative text available. So that can be important. And there are guidelines to be followed in the research literature um, for using alternative text and so on. And that's another area that I will be focusing in on more in my um, next steps of my research, and I plan on sharing that widely too, so that we can best think about what's the best way to actually write alternative text and to share that on social media platforms and so on. And I think too, in terms of accessibility, this can be related to open data, open resources, like open science and putting things on open OSF, open science framework. So that's another thing that my lab and I, we've been more focused on lately, certainly not an expert in that area yet, but we are working on it. So again, if that is something that you have expertise in, um, I'd be happy to chat about that too, so that I can learn more about that, because I think that's a big component of this accessibility um, principle as well. So to share some things that I've designed, I mean, this was like the first one I ever designed, but I still always share it when I give presentations. I don't know, from nostalgia reason, for nostalgia, I guess. Um, so I would change many things now, but this was the first one I created um, based on work with Nancy Jordan and her lab, the University of Delaware, under her IES grant. But this was an empirical research article. So this visual abstract was created for a researcher audience. And you can see that from, you know, looking at things like how I described the sample, that's, you know, N equals 411. I wouldn't write that because that's familiar to a researcher audience. But if I was writing that for wider audiences, that would be like, wait, what does that mean potentially? Um, so things like that. And I have over to the right, I report AC values. I would not do that for a non-technical audience who do not does not know what AUC stands for. So this was designed for a researcher audience. But then the same article, I kind of translated and created a visual abstract for a teacher audience. So here, one of the cool things about this study was that we were sharing items, a full fraction screener that could be given to fourth grade students to help identify students who might be at risk for mathematics difficulty. So here I'm really more so focusing on, like I still do describe this study, so this is overviewing more so the whole study, but here the focus was more so on the screener, that it's this many questions, it takes this many minutes, um, again, I made this years ago. I would edit it now to make it more clear of, you know, click here and you can access all the full screener, or this and that, you know, more um, call to action. But I have another example about that in a second. 
And then this was one, um, just to align with that example, this was based on a practitioner journal article where we were sharing, you know, building fraction sense using the number line. So here I was getting more at like a key idea, key like recommendations from the article. Like if a teacher is looking at this, they might be like, oh, like I'm teaching fractions. Oh, I don't really know uh, context for teaching like the number line and fractions. This one has a fraction number line race course. This might be interesting. And it says directly on there in the red on the bottom there, see the full article for detailed steps for implementing strategies, kind of giving them like, okay, if you're interested, this is the next step. Click here, kind of guiding your audience to the next resource. Like if you want more information, if you think this is for you, this is where you can go. So this idea, those key abstracts are defined as those concise like infographic type summaries, but more concise than an infographic. So key takeaway messages with visuals, minimal text, and availability of alternative text to support accessibility. So that's how I've been defining this newer type version of the visual abstract that I've been working on. So these are the key abstracts, just focus on key messages to make it more concrete. So I'm going to talk now a bit about the actual designing of like research summaries, whether that be, you know, a fact sheet or a one page overview or a key abstract. And I'm also going to touch on like, what can you do though, if you're not confident with graphic design or you just have no interest or you have no time. So like I said, this is a topic I talk about a lot now and I will always get that question of like, okay, like that's cool. Like I can tell these look nice, but like I have no interest in doing it. <laughs> like, is there, can I just like give it to someone else to do this? And you know, how can I, like, I wanna use it, but I don't want to make them myself. And I get that, or you're just too busy. We're all so busy, I get that too. So I will touch on some ideas. I don't have all the answers, but some ideas about that. So platforms, another question I get a lot, like what platform do you use? I mean, nothing fancy. So my favorite nowadays is Canva. I think we're all pretty familiar with it now, but something that not everyone knows and my tip that I always try to give to people is that there is a Canva for education. So a lot of people don't know this. I actually even use it with my classes now. They have a really cool thing where you can um, have students log in. I have them like creating resources in groups and they can all be in, you know, like a Google Doc or whatnot. They can all be in it at the same time editing it. And it works really well. And they have all these, you know, if you know Canva, it has all of these great um, elements and icons and templates. So it works well for that, but I also use it for infographics, key abstracts, and so on. The Canva for Education account, I signed up using my you know, email address, that missouri.edu email address, and I got access. So I would assume that you could too. And then it just means you have more access to more templates, more icons and graphics and animations. So that's my top recommendation. But if you're just more comfortable with PowerPoint, I mean, there's so many options. You could even do it in Microsoft Word. You, it can be done anywhere. Um, if you want to get fancier, I also use Photoshop sometimes. But really, my go-to lately is just Canva. And that's my recommendation. And then some steps for thinking about designing it for your target audience, um, identifying the core messages. So you're thinking about your target audience, just like, you know, when you're giving a gift to someone, you're thinking about what's valuable to them. Here, you're thinking what's valuable to my target audience. And then you're identifying the core messages or the core research questions you should hone in on. Just what can you use to kind of get their attention and to let them know, let them assess whether they're interested in learning more or not. It's really like, how can I get them to the longer, larger resource, like reading the full article if they're interested? So you need to prioritize. I often think of this quote, I find it helpful. Like in our research articles and empirical research article, you're telling, um, you're building the clock. You're saying like, and you're doing in so much detail, so much thoroughness that someone else could read your paper and then they could build that clock, right? That's what we're aiming for when we write like empirical journal articles. So thorough. 
But here, we're not building the clock with these types of specialist resources. We're telling the time. So I find this quote helpful. I liked it. Okay. So the second step, you can select like a color scheme. It might sound silly to you, but it can make such a big difference. Um, I see people do this with job talks when they're applying for a job with their um, presentation slides, changing the color scheme to make it, you know, the Mizzou, the MU colors or whatever university you're um, doing your interview at. That can send quite a message to the people who are sitting and observing and maybe evaluating you for hiring you for the position. Like, wow, they took the time to make this, you know, our university colors, like color can send messages. So the same thing with your resources, maybe you want them to be the university colors, or maybe you just published your article in a fantastic journal, and they have a very clear color scheme for that journal use their um, color scheme and then send it to the editors to say, hey, I made this. Is this okay that I share it? And can I use your journal logo in the corner? And if it's in their color scheme, that sends a message. Um, I do this all the time. When I'm applying for grants, I try to align color schemes. So it can send a message. I think it's important. And then if it's based on a specific article, you might not be basing it on an article. You might be trying to recruit participants or this or that. But if it's based on an article or a conference presentation, you know, include all the information. If there is a grant involved, include the grant details. And then you're using short phrases. You're trying to avoid like long, like complete full sentences. Short phrases might be best suited. Um, if it's a researcher audience, you're adding relevant stats, but again, not everything. So relevant and um, selective stats that you think are important. And then visuals. So this can be like simple, basic visuals. You don't even need too many. Too many can be distracting. Um, you also want to make sure that you have permissions to include them. You don't want something silly like that holding you back or getting you into any level of trouble. So just things to be thoughtful of. This is another quote that stands out to me that people, this is from Heath and Heath, that success framework that I mentioned before, that book. Um, people are tempted to tell you everything with perfect accuracy right up front when they should be giving you just enough information to be useful, then a little more, then a little more. And I see that being aligned again. They were not talking about what we are talking about here specifically. They weren't talking about research, you know, specialist type summaries, but I see the connection there. And this idea of relentlessly prioritize and something that can come up when I talk about like visual abstracts, key abstracts, infographics for research, is this idea of, well, don't you get, you know, some pushback that you might be like dumbing down the research. And of course, that would never be my goal. I mean, rigorous research is essential, critical, so important um, for all of us. And that is not what the aim here is. It's actually a skill, <laughs> um, if you ask me, to be able to make it more concise, to be selective in choosing certain messages, what to share, what not to share. So I agree with this, that it's elegance and prioritization. It's not dumbing down. So I did ask for some um, samples and got a sample study shared. MCLS member who I do see today. Okay, yes. So this was shared and I did, um, we did email yesterday about it because I was like, oh, I should send this now to make sure I didn't do a terrible job on this. So thank you for <laughs> your feedback on this. Okay, so this was um, the summary that was shared and that, you know, I don't, not asking you to read this. I just wanted to share like this was a summary, but still you know, two and a half pages. That's a lot to think about. How do I make this more concise? But thank you for sending just an overview, a summary, because very often what I'm doing when I create this for other teachers, they give me like their whole full research paper and I can be like 20 pages and it's, it can feel so overwhelming when you're first starting. Like how can I be relevant, important information? So even with this only two and a half pages, it still felt overwhelming at first to wrap my mind around, um, even though I've created so many of these. And I share that because 
yeah, I want you to know, like, you're not alone if you feel that way when you're trying to create something like this. Um, this is what I ended up with. So this is UT Austin. So I use the color scheme. I always have fun with that. You can just look up like any university, um, their logo, their color scheme. You can get the hex code and all of that. If this makes no sense to you, that is okay. I can, that's an easy thing to learn. I'd be happy to teach you anything about that. But I use the color scheme. I'm not like publishing this. So, you know, I would need to make sure that we have the permission to use the logo and all that. So I put that there, but, um, and I can share this with you if you're interested in using it. But, um, you know, I decided to focus in on the left side on participants. I thought it was really important to highlight the random assignment, of course, into one of three conditions. I had to think about how to describe each of those conditions in a concise, you know, way, which I hopefully did there. I was, you know, only right three simple visuals there, um, nothing too intense. I really wanted to focus more so on just the overview of the study, the whole, I decided to do the overview of like the whole study here, but I was not able to target, there were three primary research questions, right? I wasn't able to target all three, so honed in on, and even though I don't present the research questions themselves in terms of the results and what I shared there, it wasn't, this was not every single result of the amazing study. But I think here, hopefully, this could give someone enough information to be like, this is relevant to the research I'm doing. Like, I wanna read this paper. This is something I want to cite in the intro of my paper, or I need to cite this in my dissertation, or this is going to inform an intervention I'm working on. Or I need to talk about the importance of addition and subtraction facts. Oh, this is a study I should save and I should look into this later. So it's just like that overview. It's not um, giving every single detail. And then, you know, I always just have fun playing around with different things, thinking about um, ways that it, you could edit it or change it up. Um, so one thing I was thinking about was changing the, um, the title. So you wanna think about the purpose of your title, maybe um, making it more to the point or having your title tell kind of one of the key findings of the overall study. So I was playing around with something like this, like brief math fact flashcard practice indicates positive effects on third graders math fact accuracy. To be like, oh, so you know that it had a positive effect, but that was the core finding. Whereas the original one was just telling you it's a study exploring that, right? So just things like that, like, oh, maybe I want a more targeted title. Maybe this, maybe that. And I find that part kind of fun. And then for the same study, I was thinking about, okay, that one designed for more of a researcher audience. What if I wanted to share it with a different type of audience, like teachers, um, what could that look like? And just, just for fun, I changed the color scheme. It has no um, real relevance. Um, but this one, I'm not overviewing the whole study like really at all. So I'm not saying how many participants or what was done. It doesn't mention the three conditions. So again, this is only if this would be helpful or relevant to who you're trying to communicate with, if this is, aligns with the purpose of what you're aiming for here. But here it's more so focused on like the how, like if you want to embed this flashcard practice, the two one minute um, timings and then have students graph their highest score, just one visual, well, two visuals with a little graph on the right. Um, and then I was thinking, how can you give the interested reader a next step, like an action step they could take if they are interested, like if a teacher's interested, if that's the audience here. And, you know, I guess I was maybe cheating a bit on this one. I know this intervention a bit and um, pirate, um, the pirate intervention quest rate, um, and that they have a lot of materials available on their website. So that QR code is not, does not go to their intervention website because it's, I'm not attached to that research lab. So I just felt a little awkward. So that's just like a sample Canva um, QR code, but it just serves as an example that you could put the QR code there, the link or whatnot to the website where they have all of these materials where teachers can download the printouts of the flashcards and the student graph worksheet. So just something, I know we don't always have something as cool as that, like, oh, let me put a QR code for teachers and they could get all these resources or a QR code for parents. But if you do, that would be awesome to include there. 
like give them the next step like this is cool i want to know more about this oh there's resources let me check that out and make it easy for them to access so that you don't lose them or they don't forget about it um but if that's something you don't have, it's like, do you have an article or resource, you know, some social media post where you explain more about it, just send them somewhere um, where they can learn more. Because again, this is never going to be the whole story. There's always more, whether that be having them read, you know, an article or having them access resources, something they can download, printouts. Continue the story for your interested audience and give them an easy step to do so. So I know I'm running out of time. I had some other examples from other fantastic researchers, but not in the math realm, but other great researchers that I've um, created these types of things for. So we won't walk through that, but I'll go through it just quickly. Um, this was a book chapter and I, for just one of the things I created for them, I ignored all the other stuff. And all I did was focus on, they had an implications for practice sec section in the whole book chapter. And I just focused in on that and created something that would just be like practical recommendations, three considerations for selecting books for beginning readers. And it just had those three recommendations. And very often we do have those in our research articles, right? So sometimes it's like cutting out just a slice of your whole article or your conference poster and just sharing a slice of it. Like, why not? I feel like we don't do that enough as researchers. Um, marketers and other fields, they call that, um, like repurposing your content in a way, kind of like sharing different parts of it or in different ways, in different forms. I find it interesting. And then they had a whole color scheme. I didn't know about that at first. So then the author shared with me their color scheme and their friends on the black logo. And then I recreated it for the color scheme, which is just fun. This was another one. It was um, Stephanie Alateba and it was a review of reviews. So if you're someone who does that type of work and you're like, well, it's, I have too many things going on. How could I do that? I will say this like scared me a bit at first when I had to work on this, but I got it done. So um, you, again, it's just being selective. So it, it is possible. That's why I like showing this example. Um, it's possible for all different types of work, I think. This was an infographic, a live infographic I created. Um, this is just me talking about the benefits again, which I kind of talked about before of like how I think it's really fun, especially doing like the live infographics, um, really great as an early career scholar. And I know there's a lot of early career scholars here. So I found it to be a great way to network and meet people a really great way. And so if it's something you're interested in, it could be um, a great way to get your name out there. And these are just my steps for what I do after I create it, when I'm like at a conference and I'm live creating something, um, you know, you want to get their permission before you share it, things like that. This was another live infographic I created during a PD session. So it doesn't have to be just conference or publications. You can do it for all different types of things. Another one. And then if you um, don't have interest or no graphic design um, skills, um, there can be like strategic communications office on campus that might be helpful. Some campuses have like science illustrators and so on, or you certainly are likely have peers in your cohort or in your program, or other grad students who are interested in graphic design who might like jump at the chance to collaborate in this way. So just think creatively would be my suggestion there. If you're at the stage where you're writing grants, you can include this in your grant budget to like hire someone like me to create these things for your work to help with dissemination. And then I'm going to share templates with you. So use a template that can help. You can have like the sizing right there and you can just put in your elements there. There's other uses, put it on your website, use it on social media, use it on conference slides, an activity for classes to create a research summary based on an article. People are sharing visual abstracts on Twitter. These are just some examples of amazing scholars who are using this, which is just so cool. So one from my lab. Okay, so resources. Um, I'm going to share Canva editable templates with you, um, free visuals websites where you can get tons of free visuals for creating whatever you want to create. My article about visual abstracts. So these are the templates. 
free visuals, my article. Okay, so I'll leave that there. And are there any um, questions? Looks like Ilsa has her hand raised. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I think my earphones just played out, so I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, so I was wondering, like, thank you for, for the talk, like, it's really helpful. Um, the one thing I'm struggling with is the language to use um, when specifically thinking about teachers and, and parents, um, both in writing but also through presenting some data, uh, especially if you're going through statistics or anything neuro related or cognitive behaviors, I'm just not sure um, what relates to them, what they understand, how, how, because I don't want to dumb it down too much, but I have no idea what they understand. Or what. So it was a little difficult to hear you just like broken up, but I think it was the question essentially like, that you, I think I heard you say, like, you don't want to dumb down the content, like when you're speaking with people who do not do like research every day, that they just might not be familiar with like certain terms that we use. And just, are, are you just seeking like any recommendations about that? Was that the question? Essentially, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that is really important. One that actually reminds me that one tip I really wanted to mention, and I forgot to, was that I think something really powerful and a great opportunity that comes up with resources like this is that since they are so concise, like we're designing them to be concise and short and sweet, that you're really not asking much of someone to review it for you and give you feedback. So that would be something that I would recommend for sure. So if you're writing like a 20 or like a 100 page dissertation, you're not going to go to like your mom or your friend and be like, could you just read this and let me know? It's like, is this like, did you understand it? Like circle terms that you don't understand. And like, you know, you wouldn't ask someone to do that. Or I mean, you could if they're a really nice family member or friend. But something that's so great about these resources, they're like at most a page, one page or shorter. So take advantage of that. Ask people, that's something a colleague could read over for you very quickly. But you, if you'd want the broader you know, audience, you could ask your friend who is not in the research realm or academia or ask your teacher friend or someone you know who is a parent and this and that. Get Try to get um, members of your target audience or just anyone who's not familiar with academia and the research world. I mean, it's not asking much of them. And then in a way it's letting them know getting... I, if you're like me, I feel like people in my life, my friends who don't know academia, they have no idea what I do. No one gets it. But if I'm sharing with them like a resource that's meant for broader audiences, it might actually give them a nice avenue for like, oh, this is what Jessica does. Oh, interesting. So in a way it could, you know, have multiple benefits and then you can get their feedback. So that would be my recommendation. I mean, these are such short and sweet resources. You can get a lot of great feedback and pretty quickly. If anyone has maybe one more quick question. Oh, and I did too, I didn't have time to talk about this, but I will have, will be looking for doc students for an opportunity um, coming up relatively soon. But any question there? Yeah, I think I see one more question. Um, your hand raised. You can go ahead. And um, I, I have a little specific question about my own research. I'm doing like a longitudinal study. So I will test the same children again in two years, but I would like to do like a little status update about uh, we did some research. Hey, think about us. We will test you again in two years. But of course, you don't want to like interfere and you don't want to. Um, influence the, the results of the next testing. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how could you like give give some information, but not relevant information that could influence your results? Yeah, that's great. That's a really important question. And I like that you're thinking about that too and being wise about 
the recruitment and keeping participants over the longitudinal study. Um, yeah, so I agree. If you really want to be um, very aware and careful with not sharing anything that could influence like the subsequent stages of the study, it would, I guess, have to be more like a, just a brief check-in. Um, one thing that comes to mind would be, I think as researchers, we tend to not really like show our faces or our personality with um, things. But if you have like a lab, if it's a team of you, if there's something where it could be like a quick check-in where you're kind of like humanizing like your side of it and saying like, thank you so much for being a part of this work. We're learning so much about how children learn math, you know, just make it very broad. And if you wanted to share like a team like photo or something like that, just so that they know like, oh, this is actually benefiting like there's real people behind this work who are doing this work who really care about how children succeed in math or whatever it might be um that could be something to kind of that then when you reach back out again in a year or so that they remember you you know that you're real people doing real work and actively like working on this project and how important it is so I think again it could just be like kind of highlighting the importance of the work just talking broadly not saying, you know, we found this and we're hoping to find this next. Um, so yeah, keeping it broad and friendly. And again, I don't know if that would breach IRB type things and what you need to be cautious about, but that's, you know, conversations you can have with your IRB office. But that would be something I would try to think about in terms of trying to form that trust, I guess is what I'm getting at here, the trust and connection there. Thank you so much. I think we have to let people go because we're past the hour, but it was so awesome to hear all of this. Um, and I think we will send out uh, the recording of the session so you can share with anyone who hasn't been here. And uh, maybe we'll put that link in there again to those resources that uh, Jessica shared with us. But I hope everyone will join me in thanking Jess yet again. We so appreciated having you here and we learned so much. And yes, please check her out on Twitter as well. Yes, I'm on Twitter of course, but then also just email me. I'd be so happy to chat with any of you. I really appreciated this invitation. This was fun. Yes, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Nina. Thanks, Emily.